Hi everyone! Welcome back to Our Home Libraries. For today's episode, we're going to be discussing Malibu Rising by Taylor Jenkins Reid. I think it's kind of the perfect book to be reading this late in the summer, so yeah. I think it's going to be a great one to discuss. I agree. As usual, we're I'm glad you agree. We are definitely going to be ruining this one for you. So if it's one you want to go read, please do so before you listen to this episode. And always come back and give it a listen once you have or listen to any of our other content that we have on Instagram, Facebook, or our YouTube channel. And again, it's our home libraries, plural, because it's the two of us. Yeah, so this book, I want to say, first of all, in our last episode and in the TBR that I posted on YouTube, I said that this is a romance and it's not really a romance. So that was like a misunderstanding on my part. I didn't look heavy enough into the book to know that it's not really a romance. It's more like general fiction with a, a splash of relationships, but they're like not yeah. romance in the terms that we think of romance books. They're just like normal, like real relationships between people. I don't know if that makes any sense, but anyway, I'm going to summarize this book now. Over the course of 24 hours, the lives of the Rebus children will change. Nina always throws this big end of the summer party and stories about this party are pretty legendary, I would say. And every year the party gets larger and larger and more wild and more famous people show up. and. I mean, it's the party of parties. Nina and her brother Jay are pretty talented surfers and their brother Hudson, half brother technically, is a renowned photographer. Their baby sister Kit is, well, I mean, I would say she's like just out of high school thinking about college and she's kind of just starting to figure out what she wants to do with her life. From the outside, these four siblings seem like they have it all. Their father is a famous rock star and they have wealth and fame of their own, but each of them is kind of missing something in their lives and they're searching to fill what is missing. By the time the night is over, Nina's mansion will have gone up in flames, literally, and the Rivas siblings will have to decide how they're going to move forward from that. So intense yeah fire it what it was the whole story because i feel like you said it, it's a general fiction and it's very much centered on a family and family dynamics and that involves relationships with like significant others and how that impacts the siblings so there is some romance to it but yeah i, I would say that it's definitely not like I wouldn't seek this out if you were looking for specifically romance yeah i guess i just had this idea in my brain that taylor jenkins reed is a romance author and that's why I, I don't know, maybe that's just like social media has given me that misconception or I don't know, but I would kind of classify this along with uh, two other books that we've read for this podcast, like uh, The Midnight Library or Godshot. Like they're not really like romance centric. They're just more like a real representation of life. Versus yeah, like absolutely. a romance novel being all about these two characters and a meet cute and yeah, it was definitely more about like the real world application of what you know maybe a, a romantic partnership could look like mm -hmm. and or just like the sibling relationships and all that. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. Definitely more, I would say, realistic. Yeah. So how would you rate this one? So I really like this one. I gave it a four out of five surfboards. I I gave it the same like that with the same scale. <laughs> oh, we're on the same page. I really like that the story itself was set over 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And then they did like some jump backs in time to like explain why the family is how they are. And I, I have expressed this previously on the podcast that sometimes I don't like like time jumps. I, I get a little frustrated, like I just want to get with the story. But I think because the main story was all set within 24 hours, we knew it was like this finite amount of time. So going back and really being able to understand like how these, the siblings were raised and why they handle things the way that they handle things yeah. now in this current 24 hours, I thought it was done so well. I, I'm actually like very excited that this had this back and forth like time um, order. I loved it. Yeah. The in this book, compared to others that do the flashback thing, 
this one felt like it was more about helping you understand the character's motivations for their actions and yeah. how, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a thing that we see even in real life that the past tends to repeat itself in a way. And so seeing how this happened in the past, um, how certain things happened with their mother then helps you understand how they come to be in similar situations. And also just the reality of that, even though all these kids were raised in the same household, how they respond to things is differently. And I think we all like know that on some level, like all of our siblings are different, even though we were, you know, for you and myself, like we were raised in the same household together um, with our siblings. But like to see that because of like how their personality mm -hmm. is, what their birth order was, like what their role in the family was, it really impacts then how they handle things in their current life. It was a really yeah. cool analysis of that. Yeah. I think the only thing that I didn't really understand with this book is that once we get to the part of the story that involves the party itself, we start to see these like really short chapters from the perspective of the guests at the party. And like, oh, it just yeah. didn't really tie in to me. Like these were not characters we had seen throughout the book. It was just like random. Oh, if this person had done this at this time, maybe they would have met this person. And it, it's just kind of that it doesn't really help the plot move forward in any way to me. Yeah, I guess, you know, I totally agree with that because there was, I was listening to it on audio for like some of it and I like had to pause and like go back. I was like, wait, who are we? Yeah. Who am I listening to right now? Like what character is this? And I realized like, oh, it's just someone new. We haven't met them yet. But I guess it's also, I feel like it kind of adds to the chaos of that night and that party. And there's like sure. all these like connections or misconnections and stuff. So I didn't mind it, but I do agree with you that once in a while I was like, wait, wait, wait. Who, who am I listening to right now? Mm -hmm. What what voice is this that I'm, I'm reading? So I would agree with that. So the questions we are discussing in this episode, thank you, Penguin Random House, for coming out with a, a book club kit for this book. We, we love a good book club kit with discussion questions. So we're going to yeah. link the website for that PDF in the description. But to get started... Just because something looks like paradise doesn't really mean that it is. So how does Malibu Rising explore darker realities of fame and fortune and how fame can be different for women than it is for men? Yeah, I mean, money isn't everything. I think mm -hmm. most people know that. Just because you have money doesn't mean that you're happy. Yeah. Um, we definitely so I feel see like that this book with kind of Nina, for sure. Right. And even just all the siblings, they were raised in essentially poverty. They were to a, sing a single mother because their rock star father left and then just yeah. didn't contribute. Never paid any child support. Anything. Yeah, nothing. Yeah. And there would be days where they were trying to figure out like how to get a meal for dinner. Mm -hmm. um, so now the siblings have found like fame or their own sources of income and they are more comfortable, but all of them still are missing something. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is a big part of kind of the darker side of fame and fortune that maybe you're, you're known to the public, but like, are you really known? Like your si the siblings, they all know each other way better than the public does. Mm -hmm. um, and that notoriety isn't always what you want. Um, it's something that you, might, Nina was, you might think that you want. I mean, even thinking about, yeah. like, celebrities that have come out with memoirs, so many of them are like, I really wanted this in my life. Like, I wanted the fame. I wanted not to have to worry about money ever. And they come to find out that it's not fulfilling. It doesn't fulfill their lives to now have all this money and be on the street and everybody know your name. But it's, like, still something that you don't have like that you're not fulfilled. And, and I think part of it too, specifically touching on the fact that maybe fame is different for men versus women in this book. We definitely see that with Nina because she had like modeled for certain things and she wears a, a bikini when she surfs. So she's usually in like bikini bottoms. People felt as though they were entitled to like touch her or her t-shirt yeah. because like she did this like campaign of like, it's softer than a, it looks or something like that. And people would 
would think that it was okay to to touch her, her or like encroach on her space, mm-hmm. even though she wasn't like inviting that. So I, I feel like that was like jarring to read. And even going back to how she came to be a model, she and Jay, they were siblings. They were surfing at the same time. And while she gets this modeling contract and wears sh- white t-shirts that she surfs in and they get wet and everybody can see her nipples and like Jay goes on to be this renowned athlete, even though <laughs> they learned to surf literally the same way. And it's just, yeah. you see how like their two paths diverge and, and whether or not that has to do with their sex Maybe, but maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, that somehow it was more glorified, like Jay's athleticism compared to Nina's. Her body was glorified, and it was like, he's an athlete. Yeah. And and again, this book is set in the 80s, so that's Mm -hmm. something else to pay attention to. Are there still probably (laughs) gender discrepancies? Yes, but Mm -hmm. something set in the 80s, that's, that's another another conversation yeah actually before we started recording this Kayla and I were talking about I mean we started talking about the Witcher and that got us talking about Henry Cavill and nerdiness and then we got to (laughs) Scarlett Johansson we were talking about how like celebrities get tired of the same interview questions all the time and that's how we were anyway we got on to Scarlett Johansson because people thought it was okay to ask her what she wears under the Black Widow thing and we're here like, nobody would ever ask a male character that. Ever. No. And good on her. And, that and she the was fact just that it like, was so many question, reporters. On. Yeah. And it wasn't like one reporter. It was like every time she sat down with a yeah. reporter. That's so <laughs> like, dumb. Why does it matter? It was like, this, this is the groundbreaking conversation we yeah. want to have with Oh, how do you not have mind. underwear lines we're in ask. a spandex suit? Like, it really does not matter. It really doesn't. Well, I thought to segue again, I thought it was really cool. There was um, from the Captain Marvel movie, uh, Brie Lawson was wearing this kind of tank top that cuts in a little bit. And someone goes, how did you find a bra to like fit that? Whatever that bra is, can you like let all the all ladies know? And she goes, actually, our fantastic costume designer had to like custom make this to fit under so that way then you wouldn't like see the straps and she's like but yeah you're right we really should get on this mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, business idea and that was more just like it was like female like asking like hey like how'd you how'd you make that yeah, work I need, like I, I want that, that. <laughs> uh, yeah it's impossible <laughs> but it was it was cool because she gave a nod to the costume designer who like had to problem solve and figure out how to like make this look good mm-hmm. on it wasn't camera. just like her body or like a thing that she could spend a hundred dollars on like Right. Yeah. yeah. And she's like, no, like we need to give credit. Like someone got very creative and like figured this out, which yeah. that was, a, that, I thought that was a cool, cool little story on the internet. All right. Well, back into so, our questions. We uh, <laughs> can get off our little tangent. Um, early on, the author writes that our families, our family histories are simply stories. They're myths that we create about the people who came before us in order to make sense of ourselves. Do you agree with this statement? And how did this book make you think about your own family history? I feel as though this, this like couple sentences is somewhat accurate because at some point when we recount stories or things that have happened in our family, it becomes so far like removed down the line Mm -hmm. of when it happened that you're remembering the story, not the actual memory. Yeah. And even like family members who have passed before you could meet them or like right. family members that were important to my parents when they were growing up. All we really have of those people are stories. Like we've never actually met them. All we know is what we've heard from others. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that we don't realize it, that like what our memories are, are actually like retold stories because my, my grandma, my mom's side passed away when, when I was really young. So I was, I think, three. And I have this memory, and I know it's a memory, not a story, because it's so random that there's no way someone has retold this story. And it's of my grandma at the cottage with my grandpa saying, Lou, they're everywhere. It's I can see it clear as day of like her, you know, like the old school, like when there would be like a window into the kitchen. Mm-hmm. She was standing over the kitchen sink saying, Lou, they're everywhere. And it was she was calling for my grandpa because there were ants like crawling in the sink. And there's no way that that's like a story. That someone would tell. 
that someone would tell me. So I know that that is an actual genuine memory that I have, not a story. And, and then when I think about like other things about my grandma, I know that it's a story from my mom or my aunts or Mm -hmm. whoever has told it because there's just a difference because the stories that we usually tell are like the big picture stuff, not the little inconsequential answer everywhere thing. So it's interesting. We could also point out that we all know that I teach a little bit of uh, forensic science and we talk about how memory is not necessarily infallible. There are a lot of things that can change how you remember certain events and you can even remember entire things that never happened. So there's like a whole field of psychology that is dedicated to when your memory is wrong. Um, I think that's something that we could keep in mind when we're thinking about our family histories and the stories that we hear about family members that we never met. And I even, you know, a specific example, my grandmother used to tell us, the grandkids stories about when my dad was growing up and my dad has some siblings. So she would tell this story and my dad would be sitting there listening to it. And then later on he would be like, that never happened. Like she never did that. (laughs) (laughs) She made it up, but also like she could have truly thought that those things did happen because our memory can be altered. Yeah. And we have no way of knowing what's real, what's real in here and what's fake in here. We don't know. They're all, they all seem like memories to us. So just a little interesting tidbit Hmm. about our brains. (laughs) Definitely. That is interesting. So in Malibu Rising, we see that it's very heavily focused on sibling, sibling relationships. I would argue that that's the premise of the entire book. Nina is the firstborn daughter. She's very dutiful, does what's asked of her. Jay thinks he's the man of the house. HUD is the peacemaker, and Kit is always left out. That's at least how she feels. And the question is, all of that is based on what we've learned from from one another. Which Riva sibling, Nina, Jay, Kit, or HUD, do you relate to most, and why? And how are these siblings alike, and how are they different? I probably relate to Nina most, I am the oldest sibling in my family, and I do try to take care of my siblings. If I'm going to, like, have my brother over for game night, we do that sometimes. Like, I'm going to pay for the pizza that we order. Like, I'm going to make sure that if we're going to drink that I have the alcohol here. And same with my sister. Like, if I'm going to go and visit with my sister and we go get lunch, like, I'm going to pay for it. Not that it's all about money, but that... It's my way of trying to take care of them because I know what's in my bank account and I don't know what's in theirs. So I feel like if I can provide that, I should. Uh, And I agree. I'm the oldest um, and I also identify with Nina. And I think that there's something about birth order. We've definitely talked about this, you and I, where Mm -hmm. the order of your birth really impacts certain parts of your personality. Um, And so being like, the oldest following what we think is the right path or what Mm -hmm. the right thing to do is for yourself and for your siblings. I definitely always felt like conscious of that with having a younger sister. Um, So yeah, I definitely, definitely relate to Nina the most. Um, Yeah. (laughs) So of the siblings though, did we think that there was anything similar between them or are they all just completely different? Mm, I think they were all similar in that they never wanted their siblings to know about their problems in their lives. (laughs) They never Mm. shared any of that. Like sure. People do about Nina's issues with her husband because it was like, publicized and like literally everyone knew what was going on in the world or yeah. in California at least. Um, Jay he had like a health condition that he was hiding from everyone. Um, Hudson had a relationship that he was hiding from everyone. Kit was struggling with her sexuality and was hiding that. Like it, it felt like they didn't want to confide in one another until the last possible moment. See- <laughs> 
see, and I almost view it as because they were raised in the same environment. It was chaotic. Um, Nina, Nina had to take over at a ridiculously young age running like the household. They all had to step up in ways. I felt as though they didn't want to burden mm-hmm. their siblings with anything more because they had already been through so yeah. much. So I felt like they all had this same mentality of, no, 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 I can't share this. Like, I can handle this We've myself. already been through it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there were, but you can tell it's because they love each other so much. So um, I do think that they were all similar in that regard. And then, of course, they all have differences. No, no siblings are They're exactly the people. same. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. absolutely. So we know from her previous and publications since Malibu Rising that Taylor Jenkins Reid seems to be really inspired by time and certain places. So like The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo was set in Hollywood in the 60s. Daisy Jones and the Six was all about 70s rock and roll. And now with Malibu Rising, she's exploring Malibu in the 80s. Um, How does Taylor bring the 80s Malibu scene to life, you think? So I love that she picked the 80s for this um, situation. The reason being is because we got to see Malibu before Malibu was like cool mm. or like it was now beginning it's like a to become cool. destination, you know. Right. And like there's like crazy real estate stories in Malibu. Like there's like a trailer park there where you can't get a trailer worth under like millions of dollars right for for a trailer there's like it's like this elusive like community pamela anderson had a trailer in there and <coughs> it's me. like this crazy crazy exclusive thing that you like can't even like buy and you don't even own the land because it's a trailer i think you like rent the land and yeah. you own the trailer yeah um but so to see kind of like the budding start of what malibu would become and, and it's really interesting because the, the mother of the kids, she wanted to get the heck out of Malibu. She mm-hmm. worked at her parents' restaurant. She wanted to be out of there. She's like, this place, this isn't where I want to be. And then it's crazy to see that then after their mom has passed that this place that she wanted to get away from is now this cool place where people are wanting to go. And I think their mom would have potentially like thrived in that environment if she had not had... I don't really know. I think their mom bad. had like a lot of mental health issues, I think, and... Yeah, I don't well, know I mean, if she would have thrived in that kind of environment. Um, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> we also see maybe not. You're probably a, right. <laughs> a little bit we see of the drug scene. Literally, the I wrote mm-hmm. one word in response to this question, and it was cocaine. Yeah, that's the word I heard. <laughs> but in the '80s, I mean, that was like yeah. It was just, it was like party favors. And mm-hmm. and you see this at their party. There's someone just walking around with a tray with lines of Coke on it. Yeah. Like, could you imagine now no. walking into a party? I could not imagine <laughs> no. that. I, I'm already uncomfortable thinking about it. <laughs> it's like the cocaine, like there's no way you could not ingest it at that point because it's just like floating around in the air. In the air. It's like a hot box <laughs> for cocaine. Eesh. That would not be fun for me, I don't think. I've never tried no. cocaine. I can say that confidently. So don't know that I would enjoy it. I'm already too high strung. I don't need anything <laughs> else. <laughs> so the no- this novel is in part about the way we repeat mistakes of our parents or we try to avoid doing things so as to not like repeat it. How is Nina's life shaped? by her mother and how has your own life been shaped by the people who raised you we've already talked about it for nina she Mm -hmm. had to become the mother because her mother was not capable yeah and then her mother passed away when all the kids were really young and nina had to step up again and figure out some way to um to get by she wasn't even 18 yet and because it was kind of this small little town like the the principal of the school just told her like yep just make sure that we get an adult signature like meaning like forge it until you're 18 so that way then they don't have to separate all the kids into Mm -hmm. different foster cares because Nina was a few months away from being 18 and somehow Nina just like did everything she could to to get by for her family yeah I do think that it's it seems common that a child would repeat the mistakes of the parents 
but I like that in this particular story, while the circumstances repeat in Nina's case, it does seem that she learned. Like her husband mm. ended up leaving her for another woman, but you know, unlike her mother, she did not want him to come back. It kind of seemed like her mother was always just waiting for their father to come home and he never did. Whereas like Nina, it felt like she was ready to close that chapter and just keep moving on with life. Mm -hmm. Trying to break some of the patterns, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Kind of like a Godshot breaking patterns. Yes. And And so the the next part of the question, yeah, is how do the people in your life shape your life? And I think that that's, I mean, that's realistic. I think whoever you spend the most time with is going to bring out different qualities in you and that's going to impact what you do and how you act. Definitely. So kind of going back to their father, his name is Mick and he is kind of the villain in the book. I mean, he like leaves them. They're all young. When their mother dies, he does not come back to take care of them. He could be seen as the villain. But he also is portrayed with a little bit of sympathy and uh, humanity. Why do you think he was portrayed that way? And do you think he got what he deserved in the end? Well, I mean, this book is is like a realistic fiction. This is this could be any family. Mm-hmm. No, most people are not truly villains or yeah, evil. Yeah, not entirely. Right. So did he make a lot of really lousy decisions? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did he let his kids down multiple times? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But he also was raised in a toxic household. Um, and so I, I feel like part of him thought, like, it's better that I'm not there. I can't provide these kids with what they need again no good decisions that Mick yeah. made pretty much but you know nothing is perfectly black and white mm-hmm. and to, to speak on the second part of this question the do you think he got what he deserved in the end um he shows up at Nina's party because Kit invited him and Basically is like, I want to be a part of this family and I'm really sorry for everything that happened. And all the kids are basically like, nah, it's too late, man. Sorry. Bye. Um, So that's kind of what he got. And the question being, if he deserved that, I don't think that anyone deserves to be purposely excluded from their family. But at the same time, they don't have any frame of reference to believe that he is actually going to put an effort into being a part of things now. Right. I think realistically, if he really wants to be in their life, he needs to keep trying to show up. Even if they're saying no, not right now, no right now. Eventually, if they see a pattern of him trying, that might be a different conversation. I think what the kids are saying at this moment is like, no, we have no proof of of what you're saying is going to be accurate. In Mm -hmm. fact, we have proof that every time you make promises, you break them. Mm -hmm. So we're not in a position to handle that right now. And that's completely fair. So we'll see what Mick does with it. I feel like he's, is a selfish person. So I don't think he'll, I think him showing up that one time is about all he could offer. Yeah. I'm not sure that we'll ever see Mick again, but You know, if you have read Malibu Rising or you're interested in it, there is a character named Carrie Soto, who is a tennis player. And this is the woman that Nina's husband leaves her for. And um, Taylor Jenkins Reid recently came out with a book about Carrie Soto. So it's called Carrie Soto is Back. But who knows? Yeah, it is cool. Yeah, I'd be curious to read that book. So what do you think about the structure of the novel being that it takes place in 24 hours and how do you think that influenced the pacing? Yeah, I already said it. I I loved it. I love that our present day was only a singular 24 hours, um, but that we would have these really awesome flashbacks. I thought it felt really natural to like follow that. It was like easy to, to understand besides like, as we said, those few random 
points of view from mm -hmm. random people at the parties. But whenever we were in like the siblings or like a memory of Mick or a memory of their mom, it was, I loved it. I thought it really, really lended itself to the pace of the book. I, I again, loved it. Mm -hmm. I, you, Carrie? I liked it. I mean, the book opens with uh, this short little chapter that, basically is saying that Malibu catches on fire. Like wildfires are common in California and wildfires hit Malibu every once in a while or other types of fires that are purposely set. But um, it kind of like gives you this frame of reference for how a single day can change lives. And yeah, it's that's kind of what this entire book is saying, that a single day changed the lives of not just these four people, but other people that were present at the party. And it didn't feel like because we were restricted to a single day that it was like boring or that the pacing was slow. Like it really did build as it went. It got like more and more and more chaotic. <laughs> and believe me, that mm. party was freaking chaotic. Yeah. People swinging from chandeliers and peeing on expensive paintings. And it was wild. <laughs> I think it also helped too because we had the four siblings. So we had kind of different points of view of the four throughout the night. So like realistically in a 24 hour window, you're not active the entire time. So it just felt natural that we would sometimes be in other people's points of view and back and forth. So yep. I thought it was fun. And then kind of going back to the fire, we started the book with uh, scenes of fire and we end the book with scenes of fire. What's the significance here? What's the symbolism? And uh, what does it mean to have a nature to burn? Uh, I think that's exactly the point of this is that it's about like cleansing. It's, a, it's in the nature of things to burn and then to have like regrowth and, and to rebuild from it. So forest fires are a necessity to some extent, obviously mm -hmm. when they get out of control, that's a different scenario, but it, it needs to happen to then have like regrowth and new growth. Yeah. So it's just like a cycle of things. And I think that for the family, we see that like, yes, Nina's house burnt down, but it's symbolic of now this like new start that she's going to like grow from and all the siblings, they were able to like work through a bunch of things. Yeah. Um, I totally agree with that. And even I mean, there are controlled fires like Kayla. She lives kind of near the Croatian National Forest and they occasionally will do a controlled fire to burn all the underbrush because mm -hmm. some of it is like uh, like evasive species. So they burn it so that like natural species can try to come back. Um, and also to prevent a wildfire from yeah. starting and then lighting up everything. So, yeah, I, yeah. I think that. This, in this book, the symbolism is more like a phoenix, that something can be reborn from the destruction yes, of fire. Yes, that's a great, great analysis. Yeah, Nina is able to leave this life behind where she's been mentally drained and she's able to pursue a life that is more fulfilling and is more about what she wants as an individual, less about thinking about others. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all in all, I really like this one. Yeah, I did too, actually. I would I would definitely recommend this for certain people in my life yeah. to read. So Yeah, getting into it, I didn't think that I would, just because I did come in with the misconception that it was a romance, but it really did pick yes. up, and I was like, I'm just going to stay up until 2 a.m. and finish this book. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just finish this. Yeah. yeah. Might as well knock it out. <laughs> so, so coming up next, we're going back to a world that – we love. Mm -hmm. um, Printhian is coming back. We're going to be reading A Court of Silver Flames by Sarah J. Mass. A little bit of a pivot because this is through Nesta's point of view, whereas the first three books were through Favor's point of view. Um, but yeah, excited to get back to that world. And a little heads up, this one is spicy. And by yeah, spicy, I mean, the... don't let your kids read this book. <laughs> it's got my least favorite <laughs> word no. often. Often. And if you yeah, are a regular it's... listener here, you know what my least favorite word is. <laughs> but yeah. But it's still Sarah J. Mass and we love her. So yeah. I will say there is on Goodreads currently listed 
a book five, untitled book five for the Actar series. So maybe it in the next be year or so we'll get another one and it yeah, better be Asriel. I agree. <laughs> if it's Elaine and not Asriel, I might lose my mind. Yeah. Guess we'll see. So if you enjoyed our conversation today, be sure to listen to, to some of our previous episodes. If you decide to head over to our Instagram, leave us a surfer emoji for this episode. Of course, let us know if there's anything you would like for us to read and discuss in the future. We really appreciate you guys listening and or watching and we'll speak to you guys next time. Bye. Bye.